wanted to use really sure. Mr. Vice President, uh, the Vice President has to leave, but he's asked, uh, he's agreed to take a few questions, and several of you uh, have submitted uh, some very good ones here. Uh, we ask also that once the uh, event is over, if you could please stay seated so the Vice President can depart, and then, uh, and then we'll have everyone uh, uh, come out. I will uh, take the moderator's privilege of asking the first question. Uh, the Washington Post reports uh, that you received a rapturous reception yesterday <laughs> up on Capitol Hill um, uh, when you came to speak to ha House Republicans. But it co then says, quote, the young and duffish libertarians sat silently on Tuesday morning as former Vice President Dick Cheney addressed a gathering of House Republicans on Capitol Hill. Do not, all of the advice that you've just given, don't we have to convince a lot of people in our party first? Uh, yes, we do. And uh, it, it was a great reception. I was impressed. They never treated me that way when I was vice president. <laughs> um, it, they, uh, th there is, without a question, without question, a strain of isolation, of it, if you will. The, some people call it a uh, uh, strong feeling against war. Um, it's a, a view you'll find in various places in our society, and there is a certain uh, part of uh, our party, I think, that, that uh, holds to those precepts. Now, I've tried to make the point repeatedly that anybody who went through 9-11 or watched what happened when 19 men armed with airline tickets and box cutters came here and deployed, destroyed the World Trade Center, took down a big part of the Pentagon, killed 3,000 of our people, a worse attack than, than Pearl Harbor, that it's difficult to buy into the proposition that somehow we'll be safe if we just stay behind our oceans and, and let the rest of the world stew in its own juices. Um, I simply don't believe it. I'm, I'm outspoken about it, and, uh, but I do think uh, it's, uh, as I think about it, part of the problem, is also, obviously, is to, to remind my friends on the Republican side of the aisle, as well as some of the Democrats, that, that the issues I talk about in here are very real and very imminent. Uh, we can't pursue the course, for example, it says uh, when we cut the defense budget, well, at least we cut something. We do indeed need to play a very active role in the world. And, uh, I just believe those who advocate a, an isolationist course are dead wrong. Okay. Um, this question comes from Betsy Klein of CNN. Uh, what would you say to President Obama in advance of his speech tonight, and what did you tell the House Republicans yesterday? <laughs> well, I've just told the President, I don't know if he's watching or if he's going to read my speech, uh, those that I tried to lay out there what I think are the principal things that need to be done, especially recognition of the threat, being honest about uh, what's happening out there. Uh, reversal of the course the administration uh, has been following with respect to defense spending. There are some very specific things that, that uh, we need to take. The reception I got uh, on the Hill yesterday from my uh, former colleagues was, was uh, very warm. Um, there were, I'm sure there were probably a few in the audience who disagreed. I think the Washington Post found two of them. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> But I, uh, I, no, I thought it was a good meeting, and, and frankly, part of it is uh, I consider myself a man of the House. I served 10 years in the House, eight years as President of the Senate. I've always been very clear I preferred the House. I didn't say that when I was the President of the Senate. But um, no, it, it's, uh, it, it's a fascinating time in our history, and I have great uh, respect and affection for those who serve. I spent uh, a lot of years as a member of the Congress or, or part of it, and... Um, I think we've got some very good people there. I think we're going to have a, a tough fight in the fall campaign here with respect to the upcoming election. But we will renew our commitments to, to democracy. And uh, we'll have a new Congress come January. And hopefully it'll be more successful than recent ones in terms of arriving at some important decisions. Uh, this question doesn't have a name attached to it. But uh, do you feel the current threat in the Middle East is contained to the threat from militant Islamic forces, or does it have broader global implications? And you touched a little bit on Iran in your speech. Uh, we now have a situation uh, in Iraq where actually just recently uh, the U.S. military was essentially providing air cover for Iranian-backed Shia militias, uh, those very ones that were killing American troops. 
Can you talk a little bit about that and about the Iranian threat well, uh, that we face? Well, to talk about a, broad, a broader set of concerns than just radical Islam, uh, I'm very, very concerned. And I've talked about it frequently. I touch on it in the, uh, my remarks today. And that's the proliferation of, of weapons of mass destruction, in particular, nuclear materials. And it isn't just limited to the Middle East. We found on our watch, uh, uh, I always remember when uh, Meyer Dagan, the head of the Mossad, came in one day and sat down uh, with uh, Steve Adley and myself and started laying down photographs. They were color pictures taken inside the reactor in eastern Syria that had been built by the North Koreans for the Syrians. The North Koreans are very much players in this business. Um, there had been reporting at one point from A.Q. Khan, the father of the Pakistani program, that um, uh, the North Koreans had bribed senior Pakistani officials to get the latest technology for highly enriched uranium. I think if we look at that whole area of the proliferation of nuclear capability, that it's the, um, it, it is a major threat. Uh, we don't know where it's going to go. We're just lucky, for example, that when Eastern Syria fell to ISIS. They didn't find a nuclear reactor at Al-Kabar. It wasn't there because the Israelis took it out in the fall of 07. Um, we're just lucky Gaddafi decided to surrender his materials after he saw what happened to Saddam Hussein. So it does have worldwide ramifications. And uh, the, uh, the future of um, developments in that part of the world uh, clearly are, are relevant to uh, well, not just to the United States or the neighborhood, but on, on a global basis. And uh, one last question. This is from Chandler Thornton, a student at American University. He asks, what is the best strategy or strategies for maintaining diplomatic support in nations throughout the Middle East, and how can this support be complemented military, complement military action to combat ISIS? My experience has been, and as I mentioned, my daughter Liz and I traveled through the region uh, this spring. Uh, I've kept up a lot of my ties back there since uh, Desert Storm, really 25 years ago, when I worked with all of them uh, uh, in uh, when we were dealing with the first Gulf War. Um, there is a perception, and again, these are, are some Israelis, Arabs, and so forth, perception that um, the United States cannot be trusted uh, the way we had been in the past. And uh, that uh, we need to, to go in and, and act to work with them closely to restore their faith in our commitments because it's been seriously eroded. There is a, a deep belief, for example, and I don't want to zero in on any one particular country, um, but it, it's general throughout the, the region that the United States has, has been supportive of the Muslim Brotherhood. And in that part of the world, uh, the Muslim Brothers are perceived, uh, having been founded in 1928, as the group from whence emerged Egyptian Islamic Jihad, Al-Qaeda, Hamas. You can go down a long list, and they can all trace their, their backgrounds to the Muslim Brothers. And uh, the United States needs to convey the fact that we understand that. That's not just uh, their concerns, it's our concern as well, too. Um, we need to keep commitments that we've made and prove to them that we have one. For example, uh, Morrissey was toppled in Egypt and uh, General Sisi took over. Um, and I, was, um, I, I met him for the first time during that trip and I was very impressed. Uh, the immediate reaction here was to start talking about withholding our traditional military to military relationship and, and flow of support and supplies that historically the Egyptians have received from us. That's exactly the wrong way to deal with those kinds of uh, circumstances. They want to know that uh, we are, in fact, allies. They want to know that we'll keep our commitments. They want to know that we understand that they are on the front lines of the war on terror. They're the ones that are battling, uh, uh, in many cases, every day to uh, survive against the most radical elements that have now taken part of Iraq, part of Syria, created the caliphate. Um, it's, a, um, uh, it, it's a task diplomatically and militarily from the standpoint of the United States. We've got to go prove ourselves and restore those relationships which have been badly damaged by the way the United States has conducted itself over the last few years. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much. Um, I would note that this is not the, la the first time uh, that you've had a long scheduled speech and that the President of the United States has decided to give a speech the same night. I, I don't think they're related. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see what he says tonight. Thank All you very right. much for your Thank you.